All right, how's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is Saturday, July 31st, 2021, and we are live. So I wanted to come on uh, for a few minutes and do a brief overview, do a brief preview of a new 10 week uh, online course that I teach uh, that deals with history from the end of the Civil War uh, through the Civil Rights Movement and the beginning of the Black Power Movement. And uh, this is an exciting new 10 week online course where each class will go through and analyze an approximately 10 year period of history um, beginning with 1865. And this is from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. And it's important to understand the history that happened after the Civil War ended through the Reconstruction era. And Reconstruction is a critical period of history in this country, 1865 to 1877. Through the Reconstruction era, what happened during Reconstruction, advancements that African Americans were making, acquisition of land, and then we're still going to acquire land after that. But you have the Jim Crow era, you have Plessy versus Ferguson, U.S. Supreme Court case 1896. Um, we see uh, African Americans being ran off our land, the theft of land taking place, all these different things. Okay, so we're going to deal with this in this class and we go through uh, World War One. World War II, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement. Um, so I'm going to show you the um, PowerPoint presentation, and we'll post a link here. You can uh, re register for this course at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Right on the homepage, scroll down, you'll see the information here. From the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power. And uh, this class meets on Saturdays, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Just click on register here. It takes you to the next page. You can enroll there. But I do a PowerPoint presentation in the class. We have uh, book references, articles, video clips, etc. So I want to I, I want to bring up the uh, PowerPoint presentation here to look at some of this. Uh, do a brief overview of the information that we cover. So let me bring this up just a second. Everybody share this broadcast here, social media platforms, invite your friends to tune in. So when we look at the uh, Reconstruction era, Reconstruction is 1865 to 1877. And what's important to understand is that the uh, events, we're still feeling the repercussions of what happened after the Civil War ended. We're still feeling the repercussions of Special Field Order Number 15, 40 Acres and a Mule being revoked. Um, and the in the in the inner reconstruction and the reversal of uh, the suppression of African American voting rights. And we see this continue today. Okay, what's going on in Georgia, what's going on in Texas, and Republican dominated state legislatures. But uh, so we talk about 40 acres and a mule, special field order number 15, issued in January of uh 1865. We do with Juneteenth. Uh, the assassination of Lincoln, the end of the Civil War, and the 13th Amendment ratified December 6, 1865. So for a 14-year period, the U.S. government took steps um, to try and integrate the nation's newly freed uh, African-American population into society. And I'm going to post a link here also so you can register for this uh 10 week online course. We do the class live. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch it over and over again. And uh, the class is regularly $130, it's on sale $80. Uh, between 1863 and 1877, the U.S. government undertook the task of integrating nearly 4 million uh, formerly enslaved people, nearly 4 million formerly enslaved people into society. After the Civil War, uh, bitterly divided the country over the issue of slavery. 
a white slave holding South that had built its economy and culture on slave labor was now forced by its defeat in a war that claimed 620,000 lives to change its economic, political, and social relations with African-Americans. And what we're going to see is that when you read the statements of secession from these uh, uh, slaveholding states that made up the Confederacy, the, the, the uh, CSA, Confederate States of America, when you read their statements of secession and them saying why they were seceding from the Union, they talked about how uh, slavery was essential to their way of life, way of life and essential to the uh, to the wealth that they built. All right. So we're going to see that uh, the South is going to be largely destroyed. Uh, and this is a period of time when they're not just trying to reintegrate or integrate African-Americans into the population and figure out what are, what's going to happen with this population. Uh, but also they're trying to rebuild the South at the same time. OK, they're trying to rebuild the South at the same time. So. Um, so we deal with 40 acres and a mule special field order number 15, which is important to understand. And it's important to understand that this did not apply to all uh, all of the land in the south. It was 400,000 acres of uh, coastal land, 400,000 acres of coastal land in South Carolina, uh, Georgia and Florida. And it was broken up into plots of up to uh, 40 acres per plot. And. Um, it's going to be divided amongst about 40,000 African-American families. OK, uh, the phrase 40 acres in the mule evokes the federal government's effort uh, or failure to redistribute land after the Civil War and the economic hardship that African-Americans suffered as a result. As northern armies moved through the south at the end of the war, African-Americans began cultivating land abandoned by whites. Rumors developed that land would be seized from Confederates and given or sold to freedmen, okay, the former slaves, the freedmen. These rumors rested on solid foundations. Abolitionists had discussed land redistribution at the beginning of the war. And in 1863, President Abraham Lincoln ordered 20,000 acres of land confiscated in South Carolina sold to freedmen in 20 acre pots. Secretary of the State um, Salmon Chase expanded the offering to 40 acres per family. OK, so uh, but what we're going to see is that this land is going to be taken back by President Andrew Johnson, who succeeded Lincoln, who was sympathetic. And Johnson is, is sympathetic to the Confederacy and sympathetic to the South. All right. Um, so we talk about uh, General William T. Sherman, January 16th, 1865, um, issuing a special field order number 15, which redistributed uh, roughly 40,000 confiscated acres of land. And uh, it's going to be in Georgia, coastal land in Georgia, South Carolina and Florida. The mule is going to be added months later and is going to be loaned. Uh, originally, it was just 40 acres and there was no talk about a mule. All right. So we're going to see that the reason why this land was given, it was not to compensate African-Americans for work that they already did. It was coming to the realization that the slaves were going to be freed. And there was a meeting that uh, was held with uh, African-American leaders, most of them ministers. African-American ministers, and they were asked, what do your people need to be free? What do your people need to be independent? They overwhelmingly said land. OK, so uh, it wasn't. A situation where the government said, we're going to give you this land because you work for free. They were saying, we're going to give you this land. Because so you could be independent and it was supposed to be uh, it was the, 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 the land that we lived on in those areas. It was only supposed to be occupied by African-Americans. And we were supposed to be self-governing also. So it's going to be a nation within a nation. When you actually read it, we go through and look at the different portions of special field order number 15 in the class. So it, 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 it's different than what a lot of people actually thought it was. 
that's why we have to go through and study this history and, and what we're going to see we to, to better understand where we are today and how we got here we have to understand the history of what happened the laws and policies the events and the movements all these things that took place uh previously okay to understand where we are today how we got here and where we need to go from here all right uh let's continue so this is sarah rector sarah rector is very important to understanding uh this history because then this ties into the um uh, this ties into the uh black freedman indian treaties the 1866 the black freedman indian treaties 1866 this ties into oklahoma um and the uh, choctaw chickasaw creek cherokee and seminole indians who all owned uh african slaves and uh what happened after the civil war ends and this uh redistribution of the land to the uh enslaved africans that these five civilized tribes and native americans own all right and this land distribution that took place because of the black freedmen indian treaties of 1866 this is going to play into the uh origins of black wall street in tulsa oklahoma and the greenwood district in tulsa because tulsa was founded by creek indians uh, uh around uh, 1834 1836 it was founded by creek indians who got pushed off their land in the southeastern united states because of the indian removal act of uh, 1830 signed in the law by president uh, uh andrew jackson and these five civilized tribes and native americans the choctaw chickasaw creek cherokee and seminole indians they're going to all get pushed off their land in southeastern united states and they go over a thousand miles west into oklahoma all right so um and they take their african slaves with them about a third of the people who were on the trail of tears were african people these were enslaved africans so when we talk about the trail of tears oftentimes the african slaves that were on the trail of tears are not talked about all right but sarah rector's family was um descendants of uh enslaved uh creek indians and her family got land because of the black freedmen indian treaties of 1866 her parents had uh, had, uh, had been of uh, enslaved Creek uh, Indian ancestry. And this land redistribution will also tie into the uh, Dawes Allotment Act of 1887. See, we have to go through and, 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 and understand all this history that took place. This is why this is extremely important. To understand what's taking place today, the, the, the attacks on critical race theory, the suppression of, of uh, especially African-American votes with the was taking place in 48 uh state legislatures okay it was taking place in 48 state legislatures and the um um 48 state legislatures pushing 389 voter restriction bills and all this stuff to understand all this okay we see this suppression of the vote taking place uh largely after the 15th amendment of 1870 is ratified and then we're going to see it intensify with things like the uh, Texas state constitution of 1876, which uh, has the purity of the ballot box clause in it. We're going to see it really escalate in 1890 with the Mississippi state constitution and the Mississippi state convention, where uh, they said, we are here to exclude the Negro because the majority of the population of Mississippi in 1890 was African-American. OK, so we're going to see how all this history plays out and understand cause and effect as well. Historical events don't happen in a vacuum. They are the culmination of a sequence of historical events that lead to a larger event taking place. So we go through and look at the three um, uh, constitutional amendments during Reconstruction, 13th Amendment, which uh, legally uh, freed the slaves and um, ended chattel slavery. We look at the 14th Amendment, which gave uh, citizenship rights to them. Um, we look at the 15th Amendment, which guar it guaranteed the right to vote to African-American men. Now, nowhere in the U.S. Constitution does it explicitly give the right to vote to anybody. Nowhere in the U.S. Constitution does it explicitly give the right to vote to anybody. 
but the 15th amendment guaranteed the right to vote to african-american men it did not apply to african-american women at this time and we're going to see felony disenfranchisement is going to be enacted shortly after this uh 1870 1871 things like this you're going to see laws being passed in southern states uh that say if uh you're convicted of a crime you lose your voting rights that was targeting african-american men because you have former slaves now voting determining laws and policies that govern white men and there was a lot of white people who resented this okay and they're going to be about two thousand african-american men elected to uh public office during this reconstruction era okay so we look at that then we, we'll also look at things like the um uh the force acts the four force acts uh during reconstruction especially the ku klux klan act of 1871 and the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871 was designed to attack the to design a crackdown on the Ku Klux Klan, who, who was killing African Americans, but they were and, and lynching us. But they were also attacking white Republicans and white abolitionists, lynching them as well. Um, the 14th Amendment ratified in 1868 defined citizenship and guaranteed uh, due process and equal protection of the law to all vigilante groups like the Ku Klux Klan, which was founded December 24th, 1865 in Pulaski, Tennessee, uh, founded Christmas Eve. Uh, uh, however, freely threatened African-Americans and their white allies in the South and undermined the Republican Party's plan for reconstruction. The bill authorized the president of the United States to intervene in the former rebel states that attempted to deny quote, any person or any class of persons of the equal protection of the laws or of equal privileges or immunities under the laws to take uh, action against this newly defined federal crime. The president could suspend habeas corpus, deploy the U.S. military or use, quote, other means as he may deem necessary, end quote. So this is from history.house.gov. History.house.gov is the um uh, history section of the u.s house of representatives website history uh, house.gov is the official website of the u.s house of representatives history.house.gov is the uh history section there okay and it talks about the ku klux klan act of 1871 a lot of people don't know about this and what happened was the um president ulysses s grant declared martial law um, in 1871, October 1871, okay? The major, pro, ma, uh, he, he declared martial law in nine counties in South Carolina to crack down on the Ku Klux Klan, who, who was uh, uh, attacking African-Americans, attacking um, African, uh, African-American uh, elected officials. In the state legislature in South Carolina during Reconstruction, the majority of the state legislature was made up of African-American men in South Carolina. South Carolina is where the Civil War started. OK, April 12, 1861, South Carolina was the first state to secede from the Union. December 20, 1860, the major provisions of the uh, of the force acts authorized federal authorities to enforce penalties upon anyone interfering with the registration, voting office holding or jury service of african-americans all right um provided it provided for federal election supervisors and empowered the president to use military forces to make summary arrests under the act of april 20th 1871 and that that's the that's the third of the force acts that's known as the ku klux klan act of 1871 under this act, nine South Carolina counties were placed under martial law in October 1871 by President Ulysses S. Grant. This act and earlier statutes resulted in more than 5,000 indictments of, of, of Klan members and white supremacist things like this in South Carolina and 1,250 convictions throughout the South. In subsequent Supreme Court decisions, various sections of the act were, de were declared unconstitutional. That's in uh, uh, about 1883, U.S. Supreme Court struck down portions of.
with the uh, uh, Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, but it's still on the books and the, it, there's portions of it on the books and it's still being used today. Uh, we talk about the Mississippi State uh, Convention of 1890, where Solomon Saladin Calhoun, who was the white judge, presided over the uh, uh, who presided over the convention, said, "We are here to exclude the Negro because they were trying to uh, disenfranchise African Americans and suppress our vote in 1890 in in Mississippi. Still trying to do it today." Uh, and, and and what they're going to do is they in 1890 they imposed a literacy tests and uh, poll taxes to suppress the African American vote in South Carolina and in, in Mississippi and the majority of the population in Mississippi in 1890 was African American. Now James Vardaman in 1890 served in, in in the Mississippi State Legislature and he was uh, at the uh, uh, state convention there uh, in Mississippi. He said there is no use to equivocate or lie about the matter. OK, in Mississippi, we have we have in our Constitution uh, leg legislated against the racial pecu peculiarities of the Negro. When that uh, device fails, we will resort to something else. OK, so what they're doing is they are attacking the African-American vote. Because a lot of these white people resented former slaves being able to uh, not just vote, but being elected to office and passing laws that benefited African-Americans and, and passing laws that white people had to abide by. The impact of the legislation was swift. By 1910, registered voters among African-Americans dropped to 15 percent in Virginia and under 2 percent in both Alabama and Mississippi, because after that 1890 Mississippi state constitution, then other Southern states started adopting similar state constitutions that had poll taxes and literacy tests and these obstacles to the 15th amendment to, to, to reduce the number of African-Americans voting and reduce the number of African-Americans registered to vote. So we're gonna see immediate negative impact from this. By 1910, registered voters among African Americans dropped to 15% in Virginia and under 2% in both Alabama and Mississippi, according to historian Donald G. Nyman in his book Promises to Keep African Americans and the Constitutional Order, 1776 to Present. Uh, read this article here from history.com. History.com is the official website of the History Channel. This piece here is uh, the How Jim Crow Era Laws suppress the african-american vote for generations how jim crow era laws suppress the african-american vote uh for generations how's everybody doing share this broadcast on your social media platforms uh i'm doing a preview a brief preview of a new 10-week online course that i teach uh called from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power 1865 to 1968 and this is a 10 week online course. Uh, we do the class live on Saturdays, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, you can register for the course at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. When you scroll down, scroll down the home page, you'll see the information here for the course. We do the class live. All the sessions are recorded. So you can go there. They're archived. So you can go back and watch them over and over again. You can join us in class live. In class, you can see me. I can't see you. OK, so it's not like Zoom, like a Zoom meeting where, you know, you can see everybody in your office, things like this. So you can be in your pajamas, what have you. You don't have to get dressed up for class. OK, um, we have a live text chat so you can uh, ask questions in class. But the class meets Saturdays, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Click right here, uh, register here, and it takes you to the next page. Uh, takes you to our learn world learn world uh page and just click on uh enroll right here and as soon as you register for the course you can uh watch the archive content you can watch the class we did uh last saturday and you'll be ready for uh our classes on saturdays 3 p.m to 5 p.m eastern standard time uh we also have some bonus archived uh content classes 
uh, one, two, and three of another 10 week online course that I teach. Um, this class is uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. And this particular 10 uh, week online course deals with thousands of years of history. This one meets on Sundays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, we take you through, uh, we deal with ancient Africa, uh, Kemet, Egypt, Nubia, Ethiopia, uh, uh, Ghana, Songhai, and Mali, great West African civilizations. We deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. And what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade place. Click here for register here for that one also. Uh, but you get in uh, this uh, new class from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, you get archived content, uh, classes one, two, and three of the uh, uh, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade uh, online class. All right, but you can register for both of those. Okay, how's everybody doing? Share this broadcasting and social media platforms. How you all like this type of information? Okay, so let's continue here quickly. So um, we talk about the all-white primaries, and we take you through our history. So what we're able to do is to um, have more of a laser focus on each decade. So I purposely broke this up into 10 classes. Each class will go through and analyze an approximately 10 year period of history to understand what happened. And we take you through the Great Migration and World War I, World War II, and understand cause and effect and how these laws and policies help shape where we are today so we have a better understanding of where we need to go from here. Um, when literacy tests, poll taxes, grandfather clauses, and the, and the many other ways to circumvent the 15th Amendment, which guaranteed the right to vote to African-Americans, uh, specifically African-American men, starting in 1870. Uh, when that did not work to suppress African-American turnout, white legislators in several southern states used all white primaries to all but eliminate African-American voters presence in the electoral process. After a white election official blocked an African-American man named Lonnie E. Smith. Um, the right to vote in the 1940 Texas Democratic Party, the NAACP's Thurgood Marshall and William H. Hasty challenged the case all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. In 1944, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in the case Smith versus Allwright that the Texas white primary system was unconstitutional. So it's 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 going to be Thurgood Marshall that helps to end these all white primaries in Texas, but this what they're doing in texas goes back to the texas state constitution of 1876 okay that had the purity of the ballot box clause and, and you have to understand the history of texas because see texas came into the union as a slave holding state in 1845 and this goes back to the whole fight with the alamo and it goes back to about 300 uh settlers from the u.s going into texas to settle and 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 they're going to have slavery in these air in this area where they are, even though slavery was illegal. And um, you, and you're going to um, it, when you research the Alamo. Um, what that was the big contention between um, uh, Mexico and those settlers in the Alamo. The fact that they had slavery and slavery had been abolished in about 1829. In uh, Mexico, but Vicente Guerrero, Vicente Guerrero was the second president of Mexico, and he was a former slave. He was of African descent. Okay, so when people say "remember the Alamo," we should remember the Alamo. We, we should remember these U.S. settlers wanted to have slavery in free territory. All right, and then uh, Texas wins its independence from Mexico in 1836, becomes a state in the union 1845 then 1846 1848 then you have the mexican-american war okay where the u.s goes to war with mexico so this is the deep history we have to go through and understand this chronology of history so we deal with the great migration the great migration is really important to understand because 
this is uh 1915 to 1970 approximately and six million african americans are going to migrate out of the south up north and out west and this totally changes this country and then we're going to read uh you're going to see an increase in in race riots and things like this uh in areas that they're moving into uh driven from their homes by unsatisfactory economic opportunities and harsh segregationist laws uh, many african americans headed north where they took advantage of the need for industrial workers that first rose during the first world war world war one 1914 to 1918 and 1919 is going to be the red summer um where you have over 25 major race riots in this country when these white men come back home and can't find jobs and they see the jobs are being filled by african americans and immigrants here this is going to explode uh, there's going to be a racial explosion uh in this country now by the end of 1919 some 1 million african americans had left the south usually traveling by train usually traveling by train boat or bus uh a similar number had automobiles or even horse-drawn carts in the decade between 1910 and 1920 the african-american population of major northern cities grew by large percentages from 1910 to 1920 in new york the african-american population grew by 66 percent in chicago but just but just in this short period of time 1910 to 1920 in Chicago, it grew by 148%. In Philadelphia, it grew by 500%. And in Detroit, it grew by 611%. Okay? This is not talking about from 1915 to 1970. This is just looking at the decade between 1910 and 1920. During that period of time, we see these populations of African Americans drastically increase. And they're going to continue to increase. Okay? through the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, et cetera. All right, uh, rising rents in segregated areas, plus a resurgence of Ku Klux Klan activity after 1915, and there's going to be a, there's going to be a um, resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan in 1915 and afterwards, largely because of the movie, The Birth of a Nation which debuts February 8th, 1915. And the first 30 days that the movie's out, the movie's called The Klansman because it was based upon a novel by a man named Reverend Thomas Dixon. And the name of the novel was called The Klansman. And this, this movie shows the Ku Klux Klan as being the heroes who save white America and they put down a rebellion of former Union Negro soldiers, okay? This is a critical movie. It, it, the movie's on YouTube, you can watch it. This movie, The Birth of a Nation, directed by D.W. Griffith, calls race riots in the streets of America. It calls race riots in the streets of America. But we had enough sense to protest against this movie. NAACP led protests against this movie because all of the negative stereotypical images of African Americans were depicted in this movie. And the movie takes place during slavery, the Civil War, and uh, Reconstruction. The movie takes place in uh, Piedmont, South Carolina. Piedmont, South Carolina. And it shows the, the slave owner, uh, who's a doctor, it shows a slave owner, uh, and he's being entertained by his slaves and uh, they're looked at this the way it's depicted in the movie the slaves are looked at as almost part of the family and they show happy slaves they show happy slaves it's a propaganda piece it's a propaganda piece because see it, it, 1915 is a pivotal year in history this is the 50th anniversary of the um uh end of the civil war 50th anniversary of the uh, 13th Amendment, 1865. And after the Civil War ended, and years after, the South was making the argument that the, 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 the South wanted really slavery back because they were making the argument that slavery was a system that benefited everybody. It, it, it you know, the, the, the good, 
slave masters took care of the of, of, of the slaves and this kept uh them in check and and, and the and uh one of the arguments the south was making also is that if you free the slaves then you're going to have rampant crime these black men are going to rape your uh rape white women these slaves are now going to be able to compete with white men for jobs things like this so this was a this was a propaganda piece and in the movie they show uh they depict uh, uh uh black men trying to rape white women and uh the overwhelming majority of the roles of african americans in the movie the birth of a nation were uh white people in black face okay so you're going to see um you you have a man uh reverend um william joseph simmons the reverend william joseph simmons sees the movie the birth of a nation and he's going to um rejuvenate the ku klux klan there's an article from the washington post um it talks about the uh, second incarnation of the ku klux klan because the Klan had largely died out by um, 1915. It had largely died out. Uh, a lot of the early Klan members were dead. Klan starts, you know, it, it started 50 years prior. Okay. If you look at this article here from the Washington Post, the preacher who used Christianity to revive the KKK. The preacher who used Christianity to revive the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. And this is this is a picture here of the Reverend, the Reverend William Joseph Simmons. And uh, this this picture here, the caption says, let's look at this. William Joseph Simmons attends a congressional committee investigation of the Ku Klux Klan in 1921. OK, this article is from April 10th, 2018 by Deneen L. Brown for The Washington Post. Um, it was approaching midnight on October 16th, 1915, when Methodist preacher William Joseph Simmons and at least 15 other men climbed Stone Mountain in Georgia. Stone Mountain in Georgia. Now, Stone Mountain is the largest um Confederate monument in this country. Stone Mountain. You, you all familiar with Stone Mountain in Georgia? On Stone Mountain. You have the carvings on this. It's a huge mountain in Georgia. I've climbed to the top of Stone Mountain. I've been to Stone Mountain. They have a, a trailway, a pathway that you can walk up and, and people run up and down uh, that pathway, like for exercise and things like that. And then there's a cable car that you can take uh, to go up and down Stone Mountain. And, and they've turned Stone Mountain into an amusement park. There's an amusement park there at Stone Mountain. They have rides and all types of stuff like this. This is in Georgia. It blew my mind. I went to Stone Mountain in 2017 in Georgia. OK, this is what's on the side of Stone Mountain, just so people understand the significance of going to the top of Stone Mountain. OK, on the on the, on, on the side of Stone Mountain carved into it is, is this huge carving of General Robert E. Lee of Virginia. OK, who was a general in, in the in the uh, uh, Civil War, General Robert E. Lee. Thomas Stonewall Jackson and uh, Jefferson Davis of Mississippi. Jefferson Davis was the all of them served in the Civil War. Jefferson Davis was the was the president of the Confederacy. These were all slave owners. These were all traitors to the Union. They all committed treason based upon Article three, Section three of the U.S. Constitution. This is on the side of Stone Mountain. Now, this is in Georgia right now. OK. And this is the largest Confederate monument in the country. It's in Georgia. This article right here is from SmithsonianMag.com, Smithsonian Institute. What will happen to Stone Mountain, America's largest Confederate memorial? The Georgia landmark is a testament to the enduring legacy of white supremacy. This is there in Georgia right now. And then you look at the voter suppression, SB 202. 
that was signed into law by President, uh, by, by Governor Brian Kemp, who stole the uh, gubernatorial gubernatorial election from a black woman named Stacey Abrams. This article is from August 22nd, 2017. OK, now that was just a few days after the uh, uh, August in 2017. See, that's the same month that you had the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, where you where you had the uh, the racial attack there and you had uh, the the uh, the white activist Heather Heyer who was killed and, and dozens of other activists in, in injured. OK, this was that Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, and you had 12 white supremacist organizations that organized that event and, 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 and they, they were there and they used the pretext of trying to save a Confederate uh, statue of General Robert E. Lee. They used that as a pretext to organize there to have that event. OK. And that statue of Robert E. Lee was just taken down uh in uh uh in july okay of 2021 that statue of robert e lee um uh, and also there was one of thomas stonewall jackson they just took those down in charlottesville virginia but this is stone mountain for, for, for people who don't know okay and one of the things we deal with in the class is when these confederate monuments were built and why because they weren't built right after slavery they're largely going to be built between 1895 and 1915 and about 1954, 55 to 1970. And, and, and these were designed to terrorize African-Americans and to try to remind us of uh, a low position in society that that white people, many white people want us to have. And they were designed to be in opposition to the civil rights movement. But um, Reverend William Joseph Simmons and at least 15 other uh, men would be white men climb to climb Stone Mountain in Georgia. They built an altar, set fire to a cross, took an oath of allegiance to the invisible empire and announced the revival of the Ku Klux Klan. They had a revival meeting, a good old time religion. They had a revival meeting beneath a makeshift altar glowing in the flickering flames of the burning cross. They laid a U.S. flag, a sword and a holy Bible, a U.S. flag, a sword and a holy Bible. Quote, the angels that have anxiously watched the Reformation from its beginnings, said the Reverend William Joseph Simmons, who declared himself imperial wizard. Quote, must have hovered about Stone Mountain and shouted Hosannas to the highest heavens, end quote. Um, so they talk about uh, the 50th anniversary of the assassination of, of Dr. King. Last Wednesday on the 50th anniversary of the assassination, of Dr. King progressive faith held a march in Washington to combat to combat racism and atone for the history of that prejudice. Uh, but this deals with the rejuvenation of the Ku Klux Klan by the Reverend William Joseph Simmons. And he was inspired by the movie The Birth of a Nation. Restricting membership to white Christians, the Klan wore white robes to symbolize purity, burned crosses to signify the light of Christ, and picked selective scriptures from the Bible to preach white supremacy. The Invisible Empire's comeback was aided by Hollywood's first blockbuster, D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation, which glamorized the Ku Klux Klan. It rejuvenated the Klan. By the early 1920s, the Klan boasted 5 million members across the country and had infiltrated thousands of churches with its hateful uh, doctrines. Many ministers and, and Protestant denominations would openly declare their membership in the Klan. And creepy photos would capture Klan members in white hoods standing in churches and sitting in choir pews. In the 1922 article, the New York Times reported, quote, the Ku Klux Klan in the South and West is largely dominated by lame duck preachers who could not make it good in the ministry, end quote. So check out the rest of this article here. The preacher who used Christianity to revive the Ku Klux Klan. 
Okay, this is from the Washington Post. So th this is why we take you throughout this history, because we have to understand what happened after slavery ended. And go through and study this. We deal with a timeline of history. Go through and study this chronology. Okay. And that helps us to better understand how we got to where we are today and what we need to do. What are the next steps? Understand these laws and policies that were put in place. Okay. Understanding these laws and policies that were put in place that put us into this predicament. All right. So this is uh, just a preview of a new 10 week online course uh, that I teach. We do this on Saturdays, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power. 1865 to 1968. OK, we go through and look at this 10 year period. Uh, each class we go through and analyze an approximately 10 year period of history. And we start with um, the Civil War and what led up to the Civil War taking place. Um, and then we'll go through the Reconstruction era, 1865 to 1877. It, to to uh, go through and analyze what happened. All right. Um, so we do the classes live on Saturdays. All the sessions are recorded. So if you miss any of it, you can go back and watch it over and over again. Click on register here takes you to the next page and uh, just click on uh, enroll on the next page on our learn world, uh, our learn world page where our online school is. Click on enroll. Soon as you register, you can start, uh, you can watch the class we just did um, last Saturday and you'll be ready for Saturday's class, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. There's also some bonus archived uh, content that you'll get as well. You'll get classes one through three of the first online course that I teach, 10 week online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. And this uh, 10 week online course deals with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the Transatlantic Slave Trade taking place. And this class meets on Sundays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can click on register here. You can register for that. Uh, online course also. All right. So how you all like this type of information? And I, I, I um, decided to do this class because in the uh, understanding the transatlantic slave trade class, I wanted to do a continuation to deal with, OK, what happens after slavery ends? OK, I just don't have enough time in the first 10 week class to deal with this. And people were asking for additional history. Okay, what happens after that? So this class gives us the opportunity to really go in and analyze in 10 year increments of history, what, ha what happened? Okay, this gives us an opportunity to understand in 10 year increments, what happened? Okay, so we posted the link here, you can register uh, for this class now. All right. So we yeah, had the birth of a nation and then we deal with uh, protests that we had. We protested against the movie, The Birth of a Nation because we understood it was detrimental to our existing, uh, existing. Charlotta Bass, who was the uh, editor of the African-American newspaper, The California Eagle, uh, is going to lead. She's a member of the NAACP. She's going to lead protests against the uh, uh, against the movie. Uh, William Monroe Trotter, who was the uh, editor of the Boston Guardian newspaper, another uh, African American newspaper in Boston, he's going to lead protests against this movement. We're going to put out movies that are answers to the birth of a nation, and we're going to put out movies to that depict. African-Americans in the image that we want shown of our people, as opposed to seeing our images through the filter of white supremacy. OK, there are going to be 150 production companies that African-Americans are going to have uh, in the in the uh, early 1900s. Um, African uh, and we had about 150 production companies, some completely owned by African-Americans, others partly owned. 
by African Americans that produced our own movies. And Oscar Michaud uh, is the most prolific um, director, producer of that era. From 1918 to 1948, he directed or produced 44 movies. Read Donald Bogle's uh, book, Blacks in American Films and Television, an illustrated encyclopedia. Blacks in American Films and Television, an illustrated encyclopedia. That book came out in 1988 by Donald Bogle. And it goes through, it's an encyclopedia of uh, African-American cinema, okay, or movies that we're in. And it, it, let me see, I got the book right here. So I think this book is, I think it may be out of print. You may find it, you could probably find it from an African-American book dealer or something like that. I don't even take this book out the house because I know, I know it's hard to find. Uh, but Blacks in American Films and Television, an illustrated encyclopedia. Now, Donald Bogle is the godfather of, of Black cinema, all right? And this book came out in 1988. So every movie or TV show that has basically an African-American character, one who had, like, speaking lines or some type of significant African-American character, they have a entry in this um, in this encyclopedia and they tell you uh, they give you a synopsis of the movie. See, this is an officer and a gentleman, 1982. They give you a synopsis of the movie, who starred in it, who directed it, uh, everything. OK, and they have a, a history. They deal with some history in the beginning, in the introduction. And then you go through. Uh, it's in um, alphabetical order, okay? And you go through and you can study a lot of our history by looking at cinema and looking at uh, TV shows, okay? This is from Car Wash. This is uh, Daddy Rich, um, Richard Pryor in Car Wash. But it shows, it goes through and shows all these movies, okay? And TV shows as well. Cosby Show is in here, Um so it's a deep, it's a, it, it, it deals with entertainment. It deals with media, but it also deals with history as well. We see Beverly Hills cop, Eddie Murphy. We see, um, red Fox. Okay. Uh, we see, uh, Rochester, uh, Whoopi Goldberg, Paul Winfield, Lena Horn. Okay. The horn. Okay. <laughs> Stormy weather, <laughs> the horn. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's continue here for a couple more minutes. So we deal with that. We deal with the Great Migration. We deal with the Red Summer. We deal with uh, cinema and, and how we're fighting back with the images that we're putting out of African-Americans. And we want to define ourselves. Power is the ability to define and shape reality and have other people accept your definition of reality as if it were their own. And we see these detrimental, we see these detrimental images of African-Americans that uh, uh are being projected okay we see these we see these detrimental images of african americans that are being projected and we understand that these images are detrimental to our existence okay and we're fighting back all right so the red summer now a lot of people did not across the country a lot of people did not know about the red summer of 1919 until the year 2019 which was the 100th anniversary of the red summer a lot of people didn't know about this history this happens the year after world war one ends and we go and then, now this is also during the great pandemic of 1918 the spanish flu pandemic of 1918 this is taking place as well and this is two years before the uh tulsa race massacre of June 1st, 1921. This is four years before, th th this is one year before the Okoy massacre in Florida, okay, of November of 1920 in Florida, that was around African-Americans voting, okay? And it was an attack by the Ku Klux Klan. That's the Okoy massacre of Florida. Because one of the things we, we do in the class, we go through and look at these, uh, uh, the, these attacks on African-Americans, these massacres and why they happened. 
OK, and usually when we look at these massacres, as we see with the race riots, there, there's going to be one of three things. There's going to be um, either over economic issues, African-Americans getting hired and, and taking jobs away from white people is perceived uh, is going to be uh, over. Um, uh, or, or it can be economic issues dealing with. Um, African-American businesses being very prosperous and white people getting jealous, jealous. See that, that, that happens in 1892, the Ma store murders in Memphis, Tennessee, where Ida B. Wells friends were killed because of uh, the, 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 the people's grocery store owner, Tom Moss was very prosperous and was taking away customers from a white bit from the white grocery store across the street. Okay. And uh, the, the white uh, a grocery store owner, he sends some uh, off duty uh, 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 share uh, off duty deputy sheriffs to go ransack the store. Tom Moss is there with two of his friends. They fight back and shoot back, but they don't know the guys are, are deputy sheriffs. So they get arrested. And then uh, one night they're taken out of, of the jail and they're executed. They're killed. OK. So this causes African-Americans to leave Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, this causes uh, 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 Ida B. Wells writes about uh, writes about this uh, in, in, her, her, in her newspaper. And she said every Negro's house needs to have a Winchester in the home. And this causes Ida B. Wells to get involved in the anti-lynching movement. OK, because of the Moss store murders of 1892. But then the, so it's three main reasons why we see these lynchings and massacres take place. It's either over politics, uh, like the Opelousa massacre of 1868 in Opelousa, Louisiana, or the Okoye massacre of 1920 in Florida. African-Americans voting, voting people in the office, and they're trying to suppress our political power. It's over economic issues or it's over sex. White uh, uh, African-American man being uh, accused of raping a white woman, touching a white woman, looking at a white woman, dreaming about a white woman. But in a lot of these instances, the sex was consensual. This is something that Ida B. Wells starts investigating and finding out. A lot of times the sex was consensual between a white woman, and African American man, and her husband found out, her brother found out, her daddy found out, and they go and get him and lynch him. This is this is uh, what happened with uh, Rosewood, 1923, Rosewood, Florida, January 1923. And this was a fictitious African-American man that this this white woman conjured up in her mind and said assaulted her, broke in her house and assaulted her. OK, and there was a, a escapee from a chain gang nearby who's African-American. And the white people automatically then translated her being beaten, just assaulted to sexual assault. And they go, uh, rant, uh, they go destroying this town, killing African-Americans looking for this guy who escaped from the chain gang, but come to find out this white woman lied. And it was not an African-American man that beat her ass. It was a white man because she was cheating on her husband and her white lover beat her ass. And African-Americans were killed because this white woman lied. And, and, and African-Americans left Rosewood, left land that they own. And when you study the history of Rosewood, Florida, Rosewood was wiped off of the map. They removed Rosewood, the city of Rosewood where African-Americans lived except for this one white family and the white family, uh, the, the, the white man owned the general store. The city of Rosewood was entirely removed from the map after this massacre. All right. So this is a deep, deep history. Uh, and the movie, the movie Rosewood directed by the late John Singleton deals with some of this history. Now the movie is different, like the real history of Rosewood. Okay. And I've done an entire uh, presentation on Rosewood. The movie is like really different. Like the, like the, the, the character that the Ving Rains played, the character of man, that's a fictitious character that he don't even exist. Okay. He was probably a composite character 
that was the embodiment of real life people who did um uh different acts that you know some of the things that man did but he doesn't even, even exist okay all right so we deal with the red summer 1919 and there were 25 major race riots in this country uh one of them uh one of the worst ones was in chicago chicago race riot in 1919 this is a scene from the chicago race riot because african-american uh world war one veterans are out in the streets with their guns protecting their communities against the white supremacists. sometimes they're putting on their world war one uniforms and they're out in the streets and we learn how to fight and, and how to shoot etc and learn military strategy in world war one and we're using those skills to protect our communities from these white supremacists who are coming in to attack us um okay we do it the harlem renaissance so the 1910s through the 1930s as well the harlem renaissance was the development of the harlem neighborhood in new york city as a black cultural mecca in the early 20th century and the subsequent social and artistic explosion um uh, uh that resulted lasting roughly from the 1910s through the mid 1930s the period is considered a golden age in african-american culture manifesting in literature music stage performance and art you know we deal with the unia universal negro improvement association and marcus garvey we deal with all we don't do all this history um uh dr carter g woodson and the formation of the organization of afro uh, of the, the dr carter g woodson and the organization of the of uh asala association for the study of negro life and history uh we'll talk about uh malcolm x later and the o uh the organization of afro-american unity the oaau uh forms that in 1964 the uh, creation of negro history week 1926 uh dr carter g woodson and, and 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 what this brilliant brother did the associated publishers inc the publishing company he created in 1921 uh this is a brilliant brother um uh also in in uh african-american history month which which is what it's called now it's totally misunderstood it was never designed to be the only time of the year that we study our history it was designed to be that that one week the uh, second week in february was designed to be a time that we celebrate our history Dr. Woodson said that the history of African-Americans needed to be taught year round in schools. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. he said Negro History Week should be a demonstration of what has been done in the study of the Negro during the year. And at the same time, as a demonstration of greater things to be accomplished, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Woodson instructed school teachers. Um, he said a subject which receives attention one week out of the 36 will not mean much to anyone. He said that the history of our people need to be taught all year round in schools. And that one week out of the year is, is the time that school, school children actually show and demonstrate what they had learned year round. It was never designed to be the only time of the year that we study our history. And it was also supposed to study not just accomplishments and achievements of African-Americans in this country, but also on the continent of Africa as well. So when you go look at the annual themes, and I've looked at the annual themes going back to about 1928, when you look at the annual themes, there's an annual theme coming from the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History. When you go through and look at the annual themes, some of those annual themes deal with Africa and history of africa and uh what's going on on the continent of africa it was never supposed to be the only time of the year we study our history one or commemorate our history and two it wasn't su just supposed to look at our accompl accomplishments and achievements in this country but also on the continent of africa as well we haven't done the research on dr carter g which we haven't done the research on this uh, uh on, on negro history week which is now african-american history month and why it was created and how to celebrate it okay dr woodson founded negro history week in 1926 he explained the reason behind the celebration in a pamphlet quote he uh, uh widely distributed months before the first celebration was to take place during the second week in february in commemoration of frederick Douglass' assumed birthday which is february 14th because douglas didn't know the exact date of his birth and abraham lincoln's birthday which is february 12th he exclaimed that blacks knew practically nothing about their history practically nothing about their history he ultimately believed that african americans could benefit immensely from knowledge of their past and accomplishments of their ancestors he added that race prejudice was the byproduct of whites quote beliefs uh of white uh, of whites uh quote beliefs that uh black people had not contributed anything worth to civilization okay 
white people's beliefs that black people had not contributed anything worth to civilization. This is his most famous book, The Miseducation of the Negro. All right. And this is one of my teachers, Dr. Leonard Jeffries. Uh, when Professor James Small and Dr. Jeffries teach, they oftentimes talk about the pyramid principle. This is the pyramid of Khafre at Giza. We see Her M. Haket in front of it, uh, Heru on the horizon, or what's, what the Greeks called the Sphinx. And uh, the foundation of the pyramid, we see African history and culture. It's African history and culture that gives us our foundation, it gives us our values, our interests, and our principles. This gives us a cultural paradigm that we see reality through. This gives us our self-esteem, our self-development, our self-worth empowers the ability to define and shape reality and have other people accept your definition of reality as if it were their own. The two sides of the pyramid of economic empowerment and political empowerment are economics, how we engage in economics using uh, the cooperative systems that we brought from West Africa and the ideas of cooperative economics, the, the, the co-ops, economic empowerment and the political empowerment. Understanding that politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, the adoption, interpretation, and enforcement, how politics impacts every aspect of our of our lives. So we have to can't we can't just deal with the history and culture. We have to understand how the economics and the politics, all this, we have to have a synthesis of all of this. All this comes together. Okay. All of this is connected. All right. So these are some of the things that we deal with in the uh in, in, in the uh, 10 week online course, and we take you through the uh, World War One, World War Two, what happened after World War Two, the civil rights movement, Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, uh, lynching of Emmett Till, August 1955, uh, Montgomery bus boycott, 1955, 56, take you through the civil rights movement and how the civil rights movement gives way to the black power movement. We deal with SNCs through the nonviolent coordinated committee. We've been talking about the passing of Bob Moses who was instrumental in uh, the formation of SNCC and, and uh, 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 registering uh, African-Americans to vote in, in Mississippi and was an architect of Freedom Summer in 1964, all that. All that's connected. And we see the Black Power Movement comes out of SNCC, also Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in 1966, and Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael. All right. And so we take you through, uh, we go through about 1968. We'll do it with the assassination of Dr. King. Uh, and all that okay so you can register for this uh online course now this is uh from the civil war to the civil rights movement of black power 1865 to 1968 it's a 10 week online course that i teach you can watch from around the world you can use this with your children okay uh, i would say the content is pg-13 you can use this with your children we do the class live. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch it over and over again. You can watch it anytime. So if you can't be in class live, you can go back and watch it anytime. In the class, you can see me. I can't see you. So you don't have to worry about getting dressed up for class. You can be in pajamas or what have you. Um, we do the classes uh, Saturdays, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Click right. Uh, click here on register here. And it takes you to the next page uh, on the next page. Just click on enroll. And as soon as you register, you can start watching content. We have uh, archive content. You can watch last Saturday's class. Uh, we have some bonus content from uh, the other 10 week online course. I teach um, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips It's a fantastic class. You're going to learn a lot. Uh, this um, study here from the Southern Poverty Law Center is also very important. And we talk about this some in the class, Teaching Hard History American Slavery, Teaching Hard History American Slavery, which documents how the history of slavery is incorrectly taught in schools across the country. And it makes numerous recommendations to more correctly teach that history also. All right. Okay. So look, I uh, just posted the link here. You can register for the class. We'll see you in class. Uh, listen to my uh, radio show Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight Eastern Standard Time, the African History Network show. And we broadcast right here on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, the African History Network, and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel. If you like this video, please click on, uh, please give us a thumbs up, give us a like, give us a heart. Uh, definitely appreciate that. 
at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. It has information uh, dealing with uh, my radio show. I'm on six days a week, okay? Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight. Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation WFDF here in Detroit. You can also download the iHeartRadio app. You can listen uh, live. You can watch us here. Uh, we broadcast live uh, here on social media as well. And click on uh, listen to podcasts to listen to the uh, uh, archive audio podcast of the show also. If you like this type of information and you want to support the African History Network, you can also do so through uh, Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show, through Cash App, then also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting six days a week. Because I don't get paid. I'm, I'm on the radio six days a week, but I don't get paid to do radio. They don't pay me. They don't pay me to do uh, the show. OK, so this helps us to uh, finance the show, keep doing the research, et cetera. Uh, dollar sign, the AHN show, S-H-O-W, through uh, Cash App. Uh, so we have our official Cash App account here. Our cash app tag is dollar sign the AHN show S H O W, and it shows my name Michael and shows my picture. These other ones are fake African History Network cash app accounts that some people set up. I don't know who it was. I've already reported them to cash app. I'm trying to get them shut down. They've been stealing money from us. Okay. Um, and then also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. And also, lastly, all of my DVD lectures and digital downloads are at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. So you can order those there. You can register for classes. And uh, we have uh, digital downloads of my lectures and um, DVD uh, lectures there also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay. All right. We have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now it's correct wrong behavior. Uh, it's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. Hopefully you uh, learned something from this broadcast. Hopefully enjoy enjoy this. Please share this broadcast. Tell your friends about it, and we'll see you in class. Right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever, and we'll talk to.